Today, Marty Simpson will be presenting on healing uh, betrayal trauma. Marty is an MFT. She's our director of partner treatment here at Center for Healthy Sex. So she's involved in running our partners group and training our other therapists and partners protocols. She's trained through the APSATS method, which is a long acronym I won't uh, attempt, but it's <laughs> for partner trauma treatment. And um, she's also in private practice here in West LA and in the Valley. Um, we've known Marty for about eight plus years, and she's just a really dynamic presenter. She's presented at national conferences. She's an excellent therapist. We know that firsthand by the work that takes place here, and just a great resource. And she's also kind of overloaded on education, so I'll rattle a few off. You know. <laughs> so besides, of course, her master's degree, she's an MFT. Uh, she's a certified Daring Way facilitator and uh, trained in Stan Tatkin's PACT approach at level two. Uh, also um, has done a significant amount of training in EMDR and through G Paula and much more. Uh, uh, and Pat Ogden, Ogden sensory motor therapy. So a lot of experience, a lot of uh, great knowledge to share with you. So thank you, Marty, for your presentation thank today. You for and having please me. Welcome, Marty Simpson. Thank you. thank you for showing up today. Appreciate you being here. Um, I happen to be passionate about this work. Those of you who know me uh, know that I, it's about all I uh, breathe and talk about. Um, and uh, I find it really, really rewarding um, to see people heal their lives. And they come in our doors in such a state of trauma and crisis and pain. And to watch them over you know, the year or two, however long they're with us, to watch them really get, gain a sense of themselves back again to really start to feel empowered is amazing work. So if you're thinking about doing this work, um, I highly recommend it. There's not enough of us, so it's not a bad field to consider going into. Um, I really kind of feel it's, it's my calling to do this work. Um, you know, I like to do a presentation that's sort of fun and, and you know, we laugh a bit, you know, really interactive. For this presentation, I, I made a choice not to do that because I realized that there might be people who are looking at this on YouTube like two years from now or something right in the throes of their crisis. Mm -hmm. And so I made a really intentional decision to have this be a serious discussion. I hope it's still engaging. I hope it, that doesn't make, make it dry. <laughs> um, but hopefully my passion for this um, will make up for that a little bit. Okay. Um, I'm going to be talking to you about what it's like to be a, a betrayed partner. Um, we'll talk about what betrayal is and the neurobiology of the response to betrayal. Um, what it's like to be a person who's, who's living with those PTSD symptoms. Um, we'll talk about the training that are really helpful for working with this population and the tools uh, that you'll need. Specific issues and also the stages of healing that happens, and I'm losing my podium here, there we go. Um, I'll give you some tips on helping partners set boundaries and also how to manage trauma triggers when they show up in your office, whether it's in couples therapy or individual therapy or helping partners also with their uh, trauma triggers at home when they're not with you. Um, and then we'll talk a little bit about recreating intimacy and uh, the integration process that happens at the later stages of healing. That's a whole lot to fit into 50, you know, two minutes. Um, so uh, we may not get through it all. We may not have time for questions and answers. I'm happy to answer your questions though. And to the extent that I can, I absolutely will. Um, but w I do sort of want to power through this material because there is a lot of it. I, you can, you're welcome to reach out to me at, at any point uh, via email or phone call and I'll answer your questions. And that's true for the people who are watching on YouTube as well. Um, I'm happy to help you find a therapist if you don't know how to find one who is par partner sensitive. Um, so, as I understand most of you guys are, I think all of you maybe are therapists or clinicians, coaches, something like that. So I want you to just, if you want to close your eyes, fine. If you want to just focus on a place that's not going to be distracting, I want you to go inward for just a moment. And I want you to imagine that no matter how long you've been practicing, how well credentialed you are, that 
one day you find out that your graduate school, your main source of training, was invalid. And not only that, but because your training was invalid, your license to practice is invalid. You have to repeat your graduate school program. You're going to have to do your 3,000 hours again or take your board exams, you know, all the whole process all over again. You, you cannot practice. If you have additional certification programs that in trainings that you've taken, those are invalid too because you didn't take them as a valid clinician. You have to notify all your clients and tell them this. Some of them may be angry with you. Some of them may want to sue you. And you're starting to question. You go back in time and you think about all of the moments in therapy when maybe your client wasn't progressing the way you'd hoped them to. And you're starting to question your own ability. You're thinking, wow, you know, I wasn't... I wasn't trained properly, so maybe I did damage. You start to even question who you are because if for so long you've identified yourself as a therapist or a coach or a psychologist. So feel free to join us back in the room again. That is just a tiny little bit of an experience of, of what it's like to discover that the person that you've committed your life to, the person that's supposed to be the safest person in the world for you, has betrayed you. And that's the experience that most partners of sex addicts or, or those or betrayers um, have. They come into our office and they're often really misunderstood. When I started this work, I started at an agency. I was there for four years. I treated hundreds of addicts and partners of addicts and dozens of couples in recovery. And uh, they asked me, right, when I started, would you like to work with partners? And I thought, sure, I'll work with partners. And I had a little bit of personal experience as well, so I thought that would be a good fit. Um, came to find out that the reason they asked me to work with partners is because no one really wanted to. And that's, become the, that's because the partners come in our doors and they're so traumatized. They're angry, they're fragile, they have labile affect. You never know what's gonna walk in your office day to day. Um, you know, we're seeing them at the end of sometimes decades of pain and trauma. So we're, what we're seeing in our offices is not how they are baseline. We're seeing them the way they are when they're highly traumatized. Um, and that makes the population more difficult to work with. They don't trust anyone. If the person who was the safest couldn't be trusted, then they don't trust anyone. And sometimes therapists have also um, betrayed them in certain ways by either blaming them, like, oh, there must have been something you did, you know, maybe you're not as sexual as, as your partner wants you to be or something, or they get blamed for having personality disorders or for being controlling when they're really just trying to kind of keep the ground from moving in their relationship. So uh, it's a population that is really underserved. Um, they the, the first part of the therapeutic process typically gets focused on the addict or the betrayer because they're trying to stabilize that behavior and that makes sense, right? And even the partner wants that to happen. Um, however, you, you know, this person goes from a marriage that might have been lacking in intimacy and with a person who might have been self-focused, probably was pretty self-focused, um, to a recovery process that's now focused on the betrayer's behavior, the addict's behavior, they're getting all the attention. They have all the program work. They have the intensive treatment. They have all the program buddies now. And the partner's often left holding, you know, taking care of the, the kids, the house, sometimes the business too. Um, so spouses and um, therapists often underestimate how long this this healing process is going to take. This is really deep trauma, and it takes a good long time. There's also a significant lack of research in this area. So if you're a psychologist and you do research, please research, do research on, on betrayed partners. It's very much needed. They are not only women. This happens to men. I have several men in my clientele right now who are part betrayed partners. 
Um, I'm going to make my best effort not to use gender specific pronouns because so many people do and I feel like that adds to the stigma for men. And uh, you know, men really need to know that there's a place to go for healing um, in the therapeutic process. So what do you guys think betrayal is? What would you say betrayal is? Right, when you trust somebody and they break that trust. Anything else? Disruption of trust. Uh, disruption of trust, yeah. Yep. Betrayal comes from the Middle English word betrayen, meaning mislead or deceive. And at the heart of this betrayal, um, what we see in our offices, it's often a deliberate act. <coughs> now, you can say that Addiction isn't deliberate, it's not logical, you know, it's out of control behavior, for sure. Yeah, that's true. And yet there are choices that are made, and it's very hard to see this as anything but a very personal betrayal for the, for the partner that's wounded. Um, it changes the whole relationship at its core. And um, it's a relationship where safety was expected, and now safety is no longer, um, you know, a given. There are lots of different kinds of betrayals. Um, we had a question before we started about, you know, would porn be considered a betrayal? And by many, it is. Uh, some people have a, a moral stance or a religious stance that would make porn a betrayal. But other partners who maybe were fine with watching a little bit of porn um, found that their, their partners or spouses were putting all of their attention towards those images and masturbation and sometimes compulsive masturbation to those images, and then we're being very sexually anorexic in the relationship. So it can be a betrayal of focused, you know, focusing your sexual energy on your partner. Um, we do not uh, assume that the partners are codependent. That's old school sex addiction treatment, <laughs> um, partly because we took a model in 12 step from the AA and Al-Anon model. And we sort of, you know, used that as a template originally um, for SA and <coughs> S-Anon. Um, and so there are 12-step programs that will talk about the partner's experience of hypervigilance as a disease. You know, my disease is checking his email. Well, I look at it differently. Uh, and most of us actually in the field do now look at it as a tr from a trauma perspective. That the hypervigilance is not about control, it's not about having your own disease, it's about really trying to stabilize your world, it's about seeking safety. So um, I never use the word codependence um, or you know, co call someone a codependent. If my clients identify that way, I even sort of investigate and explore that. I'll even <coughs> say, Let's, let's look at where you got that word, where, you know, why do you think you're codependent? Is that maybe just a label that you picked up? Did somebody call you codependent and you took it on, you know? Um, so we explore that. You know, I would say most partners have childhood wounds that then get played out in the present relationship. But that's not about codependence. That's about pair bonding. <laughs> that's how we find partners. We find partners, and this is Harville Hendricks, we find partners who represent the wounds of our childhood. And then when they show up with those traits, we, you know, get very disturbed <laughs> by that. But that's part of the healing process, and I actually think that's part of the reason we do pair bond is to heal those old wounds. So codependence is something very different. Codependence is really lacking a sense of self, not knowing yourself, expecting somebody else to complete you, um, you know, not asking for your needs to be met and then resenting people for not taking care of your needs, that sort of thing. And I would say most of the partners I see don't have those traits. Um, and most of them have really shown up in their relationships and asked for their needs to be met and this behavior blindsided them. The betrayal blindsided them. So they show up with a PTSD-like symptomology. And I only throw that word like in there because in the DSM you have to have a life threat in order to, as, as one of the criteria, in order to diagnose as PTSD. So why is it that they show up with PTSD? Um, in order to understand that we really have to understand the attachment relationship. We attach 
for survival. So when we're tiny babies, we attach to our caregivers because we can't get our own food and water. And so if we don't make a good, healthy attachment connection with our caregivers, we're not going to survive very long, right? Then when we become, you know, middle school, high school age, we start, you know, our neurobiologically, we're set up to launch away from the family nest. And so we, our focus turns to our peers. And all of a sudden, what happens in middle school? Like, Johnny has those shoes, I gotta have those shoes. You know, we're, all, we're so focused on our peers because we're figuring out what our place in the tribe is gonna be, right? Then as we become adults, we, um, we pair bond. And, you know, obvious reasons we might pair bond is to have kids and keep the species going, right? Uh, but also it just makes life easier, right? To go through, you're sick, there's someone to take care of you, they're sick, you can take care of them kind of thing, right? So I think because attachment is a survival instinct, that that's why we, they end up, the partners, betrayed partners end up with PTSD symptoms because they're experiencing a life threat, something that represents a life threat. This pair bond represents survival. So some of you may know this, you may all know this, uh, but it's worth repeating. Um, PTSD is a subcortical process. It happens deep in the brain. The cortex part of our brain, and especially the prefrontal cortex, is our smart human, you know, executive functioning part of the brain. But this, the limbic system or the subcortical parts, that dark gray and the pink and the orange, all that in there and the purple, um, that's the emotional part of the brain. The limbic system is not something that we can really control with thought. Um, we, you know, it's not, the, the reactions we have that, that come from the limbic system are not thought out, they're not controlled, um, they're not logical, they're very automatic. So um, we have to recognize that this PTSD reaction is a reaction that we can't talk our way out of. <coughs> and it's a brain and body reaction because v via the vagus nerve, the 10th cranial nerve, which goes to all the major viscera of the body, it puts us from that kind of threat detection mode into a fight or flight reaction. And here's another way of looking at that. <coughs> Sensory motor information comes up through the body. We notice what's going on in our environment. We see and hear things. We look at somebody's, you know, the look on their face. We notice all kinds of little micro expressions and breaths and postures and gestures and things that we're not even registering on a conscious level. But all that information comes in and it comes into our thalamus. Our thalamus first sends the signal um, and the information to our amygdala. Now our amygdala, that red thing there, is represented by the red thing. It's like the smoke alarm of the brain. It's like the threat detector. It's always looking for threat. Keeps us alive, right? The thalamus, sent second, um, the second thing it does is it sends the information to our prefrontal cortex, and specifically the medial <coughs> prefrontal cortex, the mohawk area. That mohawk area starts to kind of talk down the amygdala. Hey, you know, maybe you're okay. Maybe this person is safe. Let's, let's, let's think about this for a minute. But because the information arrived second to that prefrontal cortex, and the amygdala is already kind of gearing up for sounding off the alarm, um, there's a limited window of time that that, what I call Coach Mohawk, this part of your brain, Coach Mohawk can kind of talk down that amygdala, right? before the amygdala sets off its alarms and sends information to the brainstem. Now the brainstem right back here is responsible for homeostasis. So the brainstem is very, very chill. He's like, yeah, he's cool. Everything's good. Let's keep everything, you know, resting as it should until the amygdala sends off the alarm. And then, then that brainstem becomes like the Incredible Hulk. <laughs> That's why I have a picture of the Hulk there. So the brainstem sends us into those, that animal defense, the survival defenses of freeze first, then flight and fight, and if it goes on long enough, collapse. And this is how we see partners come into our offices, often in those states over there, the animal defenses. So the new normal for partners is this state of being in uh, PTSD symptomology. And 
There are four slides of symptoms here. I'm just going to read them off real fast. Sense of helplessness, perilousness, uh, sorry, paralysis of initiative, a lack of initiative, shame, guilt, and self-blame, a sense of defilement or stigma, sense of complete difference from others, utter aloneness, a sense no one could understand them, a sense of non-human identity, alterations in consciousness, alterations in self-perception, amnesia or hypermnesia, transient dissociative episodes, depersonalization, derealization, reliving traumatic experience, rumination, impact on the body image, eating disorders, weight loss, weight gain, vomiting, shaking, hair loss, insomnia and sleep disturbance, crying episodes, physical expressions of rage, muscular contractions, vaginal spasms, aversion to physical or sexual touch, sharp pains, heightened sensitivity to potential threats, re-experiencing the traumatic events, re recurrent dreams related to the trauma, flashbacks, intense or prolonged psychological distress, arousal marked by aggressive, reckless, or self-destructive behavior, I think we already talked about sleep disturbance, distur disturbances, and hypervigilance. <sighs> That's a lot to be dealing with. So it's no wonder these folks come into our office very, very dysregulated, right? Um, so what is helpful? I have listed here the things that I consider probably the six most helpful areas of training and education that, re that I use daily in my practice with partners who have been betrayed. Somatic trauma training. So I, I, my favorite is sensory motor psychotherapy because it not only deals with what's going on in the, soma in the somatic experience, so it not only deals with like physical trauma experience, but it also deals with relational and developmental traumas and character strategies that are developed as defenses to those relational traumas. We all have those. No one has perfect parents. So we all have some kind of strat character strategies that we use in life. Um, so that's why I like sensory motor psychotherapy so much, and I, and I do tend to like it a little bit better than somatic experiencing. Um, they're both good, though. Um, I think something like a weekend or two of trim training probably is not enough to work with this population. I think you really have to invest in some really good somatic training. Other trauma modalities like EMDR, brain spotting, neurofeedback is very helpful for these, uh, for PTSD symptoms. Mindfulness is really, really um, a good tool to have. Um, teaching dual awareness because when you're in that moment of reactivity, when, you're, when your partners, your clients are in that moment of reactivity, for them to be able to say, okay, I'm noticing a part of myself is wanting to respond this way. And yet I can, I can externalize it and see it as a part of myself and not step into that part and become that rage. So that can be really helpful to help them regulate their own systems. Um, attachment theory, very, very important because we have to understand why this wounding is so, you know, uh, painful. Um, and for, in, uh, on, on the topic of, oh, I, I talk about it later, um, specific sex addiction training. So, I, if you're interested in this field, I highly recommend you either get a certified sex addiction therapist uh, training program, which is a big investment of time and money, CSAT. Those are CSATs. Or that you go to the CHS training or some other training like it that will give you a, a, a bite-sized piece of that that you really can use um, in your practices right away. Um, but you really do need specific training about sex addiction if you're going to work with the betrayed population because many of them have partners who have been acting out compulsively. And there are so many things to know. Um, for instance, uh, the, you know, holding boundaries, um, but that, that you might already know from your practice, but you have to have knowledge about internet filters and the formal disclosure process, which I, we could spend a week talking about formal disclosure, polygraphs, um, therapeutic separation, the information about like what sex addiction is and you know why it becomes compulsive and where it comes from and all that and then and relapse prevention 12-step groups 
S, 12-step groups, um, the neurobiology of all that, uh, what to share with others, what not to share, what, whether to tell the kids, you know, um, sobriety plans, sexual practices, fetishes, you know, is a fetish a sex, a sex addiction practice? No, not necessarily. So what's the difference? You know, all that kind of stuff. There's so there's a world of information really about all that. So I really highly recommend that you have specific training if you're going to work with this population. Um, and then you have to also know kind of what you're shooting for. You want to study secure functioning relationship. Um, if you are treating people <coughs> whose relationships weren't securely functioning, then you really want to know what the ideal relationship is or how to protect that relationship moving forward, right? So I happen to love the psychobiological approach to couple therapy for this. Um, this is the work of Stan Tatkin, and uh, he calls it PACT, P-A-C-T. Um, very, very helpful, partly because it deals with the brain and body, nervous system arousal, attachment theory, neurobiological um, uh, developmental issues. Um, it's very experiential work, so it's real helpful. When we're dealing with that subcortical response, we can't just do talk therapy. It doesn't work. It makes people feel better, and then they walk out of your office and have a trauma reaction, and they feel like they haven't been to therapy. So we have to do something that gets to the subcortical. We have to approach this from a bottom-up approach, from a somatic trauma approach, and PACT does that with couples. So if you are a partner and you're watching this at home and you're thinking, boy, I don't know, you know if I can find a therapist that has all these skills, here are the things that I would have you look for. Um, if your partner is saying, you know, I'm a sex addict or I'm not sure why I do this or this isn't me, I don't know, like I feel like I have an alter ego or I'm compulsive around my sexual behavior, any of those kinds of things then you might be dealing with sex addiction. And what I would encourage you to look for is a person who is a trauma specialist for you and a person who's a CSAT or works at a sex addiction agency like CHS. Um, and then if you're going to be repairing that coupleship or even if you're going to be moving on into another relationship, packed therapy is what I would recommend for couples work. Essential skills for all of you. Um, just to have in your toolbox and things that would make you a good fit for this population would be um, emotional stability. You would think that, you know, that would be a given with therapists, but as you probably know, not necessarily. Um, I think some therapists come to the field because they've had their own trauma and wounding. So you really have to consider, can I do this work every day? Can I hear these horror stories every day? Because it takes a toll on you. Um, and you do start to question everyone, <laughs> you know, hearing these stories. So you want to think about that. You want to, you need to be a person with a great deal of empathy. Um, if you're the kind of like, by the book, you know, there's a place for that. CBT, by the book, you know, whatever. There's a place for that, but it's probably not with this population. This population really needs warmth and empathy and, and a caring, like, nest to come, um, to come see. Strength and confidence, they also come in a very fragile state and they really need somebody to go, you're going to be okay. I know what, I, I got this. I know what, I know what to do here. You know, that you've got to send that signal to them. Um, you need to be comfortable talking about sex. If you can't say labia, scrotum, penis, then it probably isn't the, the field for you. Um, and uh, you need to be able to hold a client's anger because many of these clients are very angry. They're angry at the world. They're angry at God. They're angry at you, <laughs> um, for, you know, for letting them down because they've been let down so many times in the past that any little betrayal gets amplified. So you need to really be able to be strong enough to hold that. Uh, we individualize the care, so it's not one size fits all at all. Um, I think you see that a little bit in addict treatment, kind of, you know, uh, a more formulaic way of, of dealing with things, but not so with partners, very individualized. Everyone has a different experience of this. Um, some partners need to work on their vulnerability. Maybe they've been in a relationship with someone who's cold and avoidant for, you know, two or three decades, and they have learned how to kind of shut off from their vulnerability. So in order to repair the relationship with their spouse or with somebody else, they need to 
you know, be safe enough, first of all, but to work on some of those skills. Sometimes it's differentiation. I have a couple that's been together since they were 13, and I've seen them for four years, and they, um, they really needed a, a period of separation because they had to identify themselves separate from each other. And it, was, it ended up being a really good thing for them. Not an easy thing for them, but, an easy, but, but a very uh, wise decision. Um, some partners come in highly reactive and have, a, have that labile affect, and they're just emotionally reactive. Um, others come in in a very kind of sunken, you know, um, helpless sort of state, and you need to work on their personal agency and, and, and their self-empowerment. Um, some aren't good at asking for their needs to be met because maybe they've been in a relationship where their needs weren't met, so they gave up. And they just don't, they're very self-reliant. And that might, you know, all these things, all these character strategies probably harken back to their childhood experiences too. They, you know, those childhood experiences perhaps created blind spots. So they didn't really notice that there was a deficit in their relationship, perhaps. And then the relationship sort of added to those deficits. Um, alexithymia, lots and lots of partners because of the trauma, they are cut off from their bodies and they're cut off from really knowing what their feeling state is. So I have my partner groups uh, identify two feelings at every group <laughs> that they're having currently. And you'd be surprised at how hard it is for them to identify what it is they're feeling and what they're noticing in their body. Self-worth and confidence, often because the betrayal is so personal, um, those are often issues that come up. Um, Self-sufficiency. I have every partner ask themselves the question, would I be okay if I wasn't in this relationship? And that's not because I'm suggesting that they leave the relationship. But you have to know if, you're, if you'd be okay on your own. You have to know that you'd be okay in order to choose to stay in the relationship. Because otherwise, you're not really choosing to stay in the relationship. You're trapped. You're stuck because you don't believe that you can't, you would be okay. So I have every partner look at that process. Um, femininity and masculinity, those issues come up a lot. Uh, the males that are betrayed partners feel, really take a hit to their masculinity, their sense of themselves as, as males. Um, and the female clients that I have really feel like this takes a hit to their femininity. They, don't, they no longer feel special, they no longer feel beautiful. Um, they perhaps have given up on themselves long ago because they were being objectified in their relationship and so they've sort of given up to this fake, you know, part of themselves um, in order to fit their, their spouse's desires. Um, so sometimes it's getting back in touch with who they really are and how, how happy they are with themselves. And there's also work on expanding their sexuality. Often when somebody's been with somebody who's, who is uh, sexually compulsive, it's like they're taking the whole pie and their sexuality is really only here in one slice. <laughs> and they, they need to sort of see that sexuality can be so much bigger than, than just the, you know, maybe the, the role play their partner always has or the fantasy their partner always has. Um, I had a partner say to me just this week, I, you know, I want to repair with him, but if I have to go back to that fantasy of, you know, me having sex with other people, it's like, ugh, she was exhausted by it, and and it made it was getting in the way of her wanting to be, you know, intimate again with her partner. So the stages of healing, um, three main stages, and this is um, partly coming from the work of APSATS, which I will define for you: the Association of Partners of Sex Addicts Trauma Specialists. This was an organization started by Barb Steffens, who wrote Your Sexually Addicted Spouse. And I, I credit Barb um, Steffens and Marsha Means, who wrote the book with her, um, for really kind of turning the tide in our field, away from the codependency model towards the trauma model. So that book, Your Sexually Addicted Spouse, really identified this is, this is trauma that these people are, are experiencing, not codependency. So these three stages, crisis and destabilization first, then grieving and reorganizing, followed by renewal and reintegration. So, oh, huh. <laughs> crisis and destabilization. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, so, this is uh, 
a period of time when they, you know, make this discovery or they have a, a unexpected disclosure and their world is turned upside down. Um, betrayal really changes everything. And um, I would say the average time a person spends in this uh, stage is about a year before they start to go into the real deep grieving and reorganizing their life stage. So this first stage is really, it's unstable, it's uncertain. There may be staggered disclosures coming up. Um, there may be, um, you know, a, a partner who's, who's in and not in <laughs> recovery. Um, so it's really, couples work in this stage is triage. I do recommend that people see couples therapists throughout this process, but understanding that the first part of the work in couples therapy is really going to be uh, triage and just sort of stabilizing everything and maybe starting to understand, you know, uh, what's going on with the betrayer. So. As always, safety first. We have to, you know, encourage them to get checked for ST STDs. Um, we have to check out whether they're suicidal, many are, or homicidal, some are. Um, whether there's domestic violence, th those two things, you know, sex addiction and domestic violence sometimes co-occur. I say probably a little more than the typical population. Um, so we also have to pay attention to what's going on with the kids. Often the kids, um, have been hurting for a long time. They've been feeling the tension in the marriage. Um, kids nowadays make first discovery because they're more computer savvy than their parents are. So they often are the ones who see the naked pictures or see the texts from the prostitutes or something. Um, and then once the crisis happens, often because it's such a destabilizing event, the kids get completely forgotten then. So they go from this painful you know, experience to being sort of forgotten. So it's very important. It's great to have an ac access to a good family therapist uh, who understands this work too. You want to look for substance abuse. Many partners turn to a bottle of wine at night or something like that. Um, there often are financial ramifications, uh, not only because sometimes people are often also, you know, they have bad spending habits or they're gamblers, but they've been spending a lot of the, the savings on prostitutes. I, you know, I've known addicts who have bought their, you know, prostitute girlfriends' homes, cars. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, the trust is the next order of business. Um, they don't, like I said, I think I've stated this already, they don't trust anyone because the safest person wasn't trustworthy. Uh, anyone not know what gaslighting is? Mm -hmm. I used to say anyone know what gaslighting is. Now I say anyone not know what gaslighting is. Pretty much gas, gaslighting is the in, you know, intention of deceiving somebody, and in the process, you make that person feel like they're crazy. Like, what? You're paranoid. What do you, you know, that kind of thing. Happens a lot in this field. Um, we work on boundaries. Group therapy is great because it's a great sounding board for people. Um, it gives them support. It makes them realize they're not the only ones. Um, they can reality test some of their ideas about things. Emotional regulation is another important um, focus. We've got to start giving them tools to manage their PTSD symptoms. So the obvious like grounding, breathing, things like that, getting them in touch with what their body's experiencing, them, bringing them into the here and now, mindfulness practices, all that stuff is very, very helpful at this stage. Um, and if you're in couples work, co-regulation, which is one person settling the nervous system of the other. Now, that's tricky because that person is the betrayer. So, um, you know, you have to work with each couple individually um, and depending on how well the betrayer is doing on changing behavior and all that, um, they may or may not be the safest person to co-regulate. Um, I really do believe in, well, we, they need a lot of psychoeducation. They need to understand what's going on with their partners, what's going on with their own body. I'm a huge believer in the process of formal disclosure with polygraph. And for people who aren't used to hearing those terms, <laughs> um, it, it seems kind of strange and it's, it's, a, um, it's not how we typically do therapy, right, to polygraph our clients. Um, and I don't polygraph them, but I do recommend that they find somebody who can. 
One thing you should know in the state of California is that polygraphers or polygraph examiners don't have a license, so they can just hang a shingle. You want to make sure that the polygraph person knows what they're doing. Um, but formal disclosure is an opportunity for the addict to come clean. And, you know, 12 step program says we're as sick as our secrets. This is a great opportunity, actually, for the addict to unload all these secrets they've been hanging on to. It's really good for both. It's an opportunity for the partner to have the information that they, that's been held away from them. This is a trauma that's based on not knowing. So knowing is part of the healing process. Um, and the research backs this up. Most, I would say, um, let me see, there's, there's a statistic that, I'm, that I couldn't find this morning. I looked it up, but couldn't find it. I know that on the, on the tail end, 96% of addicts and partners believe formal disclosure was a good idea after. But going into it, not surprisingly, more partners think it will be a good idea than addicts. And I, I think addicts around 80 something percent and partners in the low 90s or something going into it. But 96% coming out of it. So it's, you know, by and large, a good process to go through. Tips on boundaries. You want to have your um, client put the boundaries in terms of them, not their partner. Because their power is with what they will and won't do, and it will never be with what somebody else does or doesn't do. So instead of, you can't go to strip clubs, it's, I won't be in this relationship with someone who goes to strip clubs, right? So it's a big difference. Um, action, uh, I like the word action better than consequence, personally. Because consequence is punitive and shame doesn't help this process. Um, so they need to express what their action will be if the boundary is not respected. They need to state time limits if there are time limits. You know, I need you to delete your stash by Sunday, you know, whatever. Keep it simple. I've seen boundary lists that were like needed tables of contents and addendums mm -hmm. and stuff. And it's really not helpful. And it gives the addict or the betrayer wiggle room. Like, oh, I forgot that one, you know, or something. So it's better to keep it simple and concise. Ask for what you need. Um, they sometimes do need help with, with um, that if they haven't been able to ask for what they need for a long time in the relationship. Um, I have them consider what their ideal relationship would be and start there. Because if they start with their current relationship and it's been dysfunctional for two decades, then it's going to be, they're going to ask for incremental change. But if they look at what they ideally want their relationship to be, then they start to really define some some options for change. And be teammates, not adversaries. Um, if, a, if you trust yourself to hold your boundaries, you can deliver them lovingly. And you actually get better response from your partner if you deliver them lovingly. The next stage of the process is grieving and reorganizing. And this is where you're doing the, the lion's share of the trauma work. Um, this is where you're doing the somatic work and the EMDR and all of that. And they really do go through a process of reorganizing everything they know. I have partners go through their photo albums and say, wait, like this vacation, you know, she was acting out. So what does that mean? Like, what does that mean about that vacation? What does it mean about, you know, that, um, you know, anything that we did during that period of time? Um, it can take a, n a couple of years to go through this process. A lot of that is because the, the current trauma is going to stir up past trauma as well. So you're dealing with family of origin stuff and you're dealing with uh, the present trauma. Um, so they continue to work on boundaries, the trauma work. The partner is in a wait and see period, um, seeing if the betrayer, the addict, is going to step into some good recovery and you know change their behavior. Um, Group can be really, really helpful during this time. Building up, encouraging them to build up their social supports, their communities. Um, having at least one person they can talk to about this is really important. Um, and this is where we would kind of maybe investigate, do you feel comfortable being on your own? Um, so remember Coach Mohawk? That part that's our helper right here, right? With the emotional regulation, um, we want to build this part up. So the things that help develop that mohawk area from a little mohawk area to a bigger, beefier prefrontal cortex, 
um, are things like parts work, like internal family systems and voice dialogue. I love voice dialogue personally. Um, yoga and Tai Chi, sensory motor psychotherapy, EMDR, neurofeedback, rhythmic movement like drumming and dancing and things like that, bilateral stimulation, um, somatic experiencing, focused attention meditation practices, mindfulness practices. Uh, emotional freedom technique. Do you guys know emotional freedom technique? Yeah. This one? Tapping. No? Tapping, yeah. Um, it actually helps build up that part of the brain. Um, so some tips on regulating tra you know, trauma when the triggers show up. You want to bring your client into the here and now and into you want to have them notice what's going on in their body. Um, so focus on the bodily sensations. You can have them pendulate to something that is positive. So you can do that within the body. So if they're feeling angst and they feel it in their gut and a twisting in their gut, you would have them focus on that for a moment, look at it. You know, we never want to push away the symptoms, right? We never want to say, let's not feel that, <laughs> right? So we want to notice it and let it be there. And then you want them to find a place in the body that feels calm or feels good or neutral at least. And turn their focus to that place and look at that place, you know, find out if there are feelings attached to that better place, um, if there are thoughts that are associated with it, things like that. So that process of pendulation is helpful. And then you can have them go back and check the gut again. Did anything change? They often will notice that it's, you know, a little less uncomfortable. You can also do pendulation in the room. Can you find something in the room that's pleasing to look at? And just focus on that. Notice that. Okay. Um, reaching out and talking to others is very helpful. It's part of the reason group is so helpful. Bilateral stimulation like um, uh, EMDR and, and even like drumming and all that sort of stuff. Writing is a really good um, help. There are a couple of workbooks. I put them on your resource list. Um, one is Facing Heartbreak by Dr. Stephanie Carnes. That's Patrick Carnes' daughter. Uh, the other is Intimate Treason by uh, Kara Tripodi and Claudia Black. Um, that one has a lot of writing exercises. They both have writing exercises, but uh, Intimate Treason has a lot of them. And also, if you know of a, a certified Daring Way facilitator, the Rising Strong curriculum is also very good for this population. And co-regulation with the partner. So the last stage is renewal and reintegration. Um, here. You know, you're, the couple is looking at creating a new narrative. Um, the betrayed partner is looking at their new narrative, incorporating the reality of what's happened with what they want their life to be in the future and, and really staying in that reality but having a new way of, of looking at their life. Um, it is, there is a lot of reorganization that does have to happen in that previous um, stage in order for this to, to be possible. Often they're looking at either leaving the relationship or maybe they have a new job or a new you know, career path, um, something like that, or some couples decide to move to get out of the area where the acting out occurred, that kind of thing. Um, they create new rituals and new agreements together. And that's one of the things I like about the PACT modality for couples therapy is that you're working about, it's a lot of, a lot of it is about creating agreements together, explicit agreements together. Um, PACT also supports transparency in the relationship um, and knowing and reading each other's body language, things like that. Um, putting the relationship first ahead of in, an individual's needs. And the idea there is that if you put the relationship first and you create a very happy, comfortable relationship, then your, your own personal needs are going to be met you know, as a result of that. They often have to go through a process of reclaiming, reclaiming favorite restaurants that you know, maybe their partner acted out, you know, took, a, took a date to or something. Um, sometimes sexual behaviors ha need to be reclaimed. They don't get to belong to the acting out partner. So they go through a process of uh, and it can be a ritualized process, a, a kind of ceremonialized process of reclaiming um, behaviors. The, the, um, well, I'll talk about intimacy in a moment. Um, they really do have to practice vulnerability everywhere, and part of that is because uh, it wasn't safe to be vulnerable 
in the relationship, at least for a period of time, and certainly after discovery. So practicing vulnerability in a group setting or in a therapy setting is great help to this population. Am I close to being done, Douglas? Oh, no, we go 2.30. Oh, good. OK. Here's another little helpful bit. Um, I like this a lot. This is Dan Siegel's uh, theory of integration, what integration is, what healthy beingness is. Um, he takes it from systems theory, which is a mathematical thing, strangely. But I think it really fits for this population. So on the one side of the spectrum, we've got chaos. That would look like sex addiction, you know, or acting out, or betrayal, right? On the other side of the spectrum is rigidity. So, you know, rigidity can show up in lots of forms. It can be, you know, religious. It can be even 12-step can be rigid, you know. Um, so it can be around values and things like that. But integration is really good health, Some being somewhere in the middle between those two things. And integration is where we get the word integrity, right, the same root. Um, and in systems theory, integration is defined as a differentiation of parts with a linkage to the system. And if you think about that, that's exactly what needs to happen in the coupleship. They need to have a differentiation one from the other but also be linked together and tethered together. So I like this a lot. My, my partners seem to respond to it when I um, show it to them in group. Um, for the betrayed partner to feel whole and complete and empowered again, um, they have to process through their trauma and weave a new understanding of themselves and their relationship. Um, they want, we want them to be in, in integration where their bodily experience matches their life experience again, because it didn't for a while. It didn't in the betrayal, the period of time when they were in the relationship, and it didn't when they went into the PTSD symptoms. So we want that integration to happen um, somatically. And we want um, them to be partnered with a person who's integrated as well. So rebuilding intimacy, some points on that. Um, it needs to begin when the betrayed partner is ready. You have to wait for that because they aren't, they aren't feeling safe when this discovery happens. Um, it needs to go at the pace that the betrayed partner feels comfortable with. It starts with non-sexual touch. So um, we want them to be comfortable again with being uh, touched in a non-sexual way. There are building blocks for this. Linda has several building blocks which are very helpful for this. Um, it puts an emphasis on their sensate focus, what they're noticing in their body, um, in interaction, even in the impulse or the idea of reaching out and touching their partner, what happens in that moment. So we slow everything down really, really slowly. It involves communication. They need to talk together about uh, what their experience is. And even with the non-sexual touch, we have them talking about their experience because that's like a little mini metaphor for sex. And if we can get them talking about their sensate experience and the, you know, the feelings that they notice and the impulses they notice with non-sexual touch, then they'll have an easier time of it in their sexual practices together. Um, and that communication also involves checking in with a partner. So it's not just bulldozing ahead, but like checking in, how, how is that for you, comfortable? Um, we have to take time to correct what doesn't feel right. It does not involve shame or blame. Really shame, blame, negativity, criticism, complaints. I like to take out of the couple relationship altogether. They don't help. Turn your complaints into requests. Ask for what you need. Identify what you need, you know. But blaming, shaming, criticism, negativity doesn't really help. That can be tricky for a betrayed partner, by the way. Um, holding space for the repair of trauma triggers. So often when they start to become physically intimate again, the trauma trigger shows up. They get intrusive thoughts. And we need to teach both parties to be able to hold space for that when it happens. Not to like stop and, you know, get up and start watching TV and say, oh, I'll call that a failure. But instead, to just hold space for it, to expect it, to expect it to happen, and, and learn how to co-regulate in that moment. And, and to take really 
erection, intercourse, orgasm off the table as far as assigning what's successful and really making the connection the goal. Um, and incorporating play, laughter, and a light heart, ultimately. We want that. Basically, when trauma happens, everything has to stop. If, if you hear nothing else, I want you to hear that. If you're working with traumatized partners, when, and especially in couples therapy, it doesn't matter if they're talking about how to parent the kids. It doesn't matter if they're talking about the finances or whatever else is important. If a trauma trigger shows up, everything else has to be set aside and you have to deal with a trauma trigger. Because trauma is going to trump everything else, right? It takes less resources to run that limbic part of your brain than to run the prefrontal cortex in your brain. Less resources of oxygen and glucose, which is all your brain eats. So it's, it's going to preempt everything else. So you have to take care of the trauma in the moment that the trauma happens. And if you have an inconsistent ability to help co-regulate or, or hold space for that trauma, then you're actually extending the time that the trauma is going to still show up in the relationship. So you're making your, your path harder. Um, but those partners that can learn to stop everything, take care of the trauma. They'll find that over time, the trauma triggers come up less frequently and less intensely. And ultimately, a few years out, yeah, I said a few years out, um, they will you know, show up occasionally out of the blue, but they'll know what to do with them. And they won't be such, such a, a disturbing event. Um, I want to say that for the betrayers, the addicts, who are really committed to change, who are really committed to a program of recovery or therapy or something like that that encourages a change of behavior. And they're in that surrender to that experience. And um, they're willing also to be a strong container for their partner, for their betrayed partner. Um, there is great hope in healing this. Um, people grow. you know, They learn to accept a new reality and even sometimes embrace it and move forward with a new narrative. Um, if the partner is not uh, blamed and labeled, but treated for the trauma experience that they're, that they're going through, um, then they end up finding out that they have a new resilience and a new strength that they never knew they had. And for the couples who are able to do this together, they end up with more deeply connected, intimate relationships than they ever thought possible. And that's what makes this work so rewarding. Thanks. <laughs>